I am going where few Amazon sellers have gone before. Yes, I'm launching a brand off of Amazon. More specifically, I'm gonna launch on Kickstarter. Now, this is something I've been wanting to do for frankly years. You know, you get into your comfort zone of what you know really well and find success with, which in my case has been Amazon, and it gets comfortable and you kind of run that playbook out and it works and you keep doing it. But as the dynamics of e-commerce changes, as the dynamics of Amazon changes, and frankly, just my own intellectual curiosity and wanting to see what I'm capable of, I decided it's time to build an audience, to build a legit brand, to learn paid media, and to launch off of Amazon. This video is going to be one of many that I'm going to break down the process of building this brand. And in today's video, I break down the six step framework that I'm going to be using to hopefully launch successfully on Kickstarter. Let's go. All right, so we're going to run through the six step process that I'm going to be using to launch a brand off of Amazon. We're going to talk about the niche. We're going to talk about the customer building the product and the brand pre-launch strategy, which is really, really, really critical for this, launching on Kickstarter drum roll, and then rolling into Omnichannel and new products after that. And we're gonna wrap into the team that was built to make this thing happen. So let's kind of start off with the niche. I think one of the most important and overlooked things when building a business, whether it's Amazon, D2C, retail, is what's the damn niche you're gonna be in? And the reason that the niche is important is that's gonna dictate how big your opportunity is, and it's also going to dictate how you can be successful given what that space looks like. So this particular brand we are building in the bike industry. Now, the bike industry itself is massive. We're talking hundreds of billions of dollars. Obviously, if you go that broad, it's gonna be a knife fight and pretty difficult to compete. So you've got a niche down to figure out what's the pocket that presents the most opportunity for your budget, as well as the opportunity for you to actually compete. So what's interesting about the bike industry is it's highly fragmented. Um, there's basically local bike shops all throughout the US. Internationally, it's the same story. It's not like you have one retailer or one channel that they're sold through. So brick and mortar, you gotta get in the bike distribution game, it's hard to crack. There's a handful of players that really scale into all those mom and pop stores. And there's places like Amazon where there's still a lot of saturation. There's a lot of brands that have been around for five, six, seven years that have thousands of reviews. Can also be a bit of a knife fight. So there's a couple ways to, to niche down. One is kind of age. One is type of bike. You've got apparel. And then you've got all kinds of accessories. Now, the other thing that's important when choosing your niche, what you're gonna wrap your brand around is how are you gonna build future products? So if I wanted to build a bike glove company, yeah, maybe you could build a decent brand, maybe a million, $2 million brand, but you're gonna tap out eventually because there's only so much of a market for gloves. So it's gonna be big enough for future potential. It's gonna be big enough for you to actually compete and it's gonna be sizable enough that it's an enticing enough opportunity. So in our case, we basically took the bike space as a whole, brought it down and we're going after a specific age group and really just a specific type of bike in the bike space. So start with the niche. You really got to understand this. If you know the niche and the subcategories, that's going to help. If you can analyze the data to see what the channel activity is, is it retail? Is it D2C? Is it Amazon? How are you going to play? The next thing that's really overlooked by a lot of people is who you're actually selling to. A lot of people spend a ton of time on product research and analyzing markets and running the numbers and developing the product but you've got to know who you're selling to. And why this is really important is you've got to find out where they shop. You got to find out their pain points, what they think about, what are their fears? What do they care about? What are their objections? What do they think about what's out there? What do they think of your product? All of these things really help you sculpt an offer that matters and it helps you find the customers that matter that are gonna convert and build your brand. So a lot of things here is, is like, where do they hang out? Who are they? What's their demo demographics? Where do they shop? Pain points, fears, ego is a big part here, language, 
and the visuals you're gonna wrap your brand in. So all those things are important. So let's move on to the product brand. I think that this is gonna become really the linch point for the success of future brands in general, certainly D2C brands and certainly brands on Amazon. If you don't have a product that's compelling, that stands out, that has wow factor, that has real differentiation, that's different than what's made by everybody else in China and all your different competitors, it's gonna to be tough. I mean, you're not gonna have the margins, you're gonna to have to pay a lot for ads and it just really doesn't work. So in our case, we spent a ton of time on the product and really honed in on a specific differentiating feature and then wrapping the visuals, the aesthetic, the colors, all the things that our customers care about when we're building the product. A couple things here, I think it's gotta be truly unique. That's really, really critical. What's the unique feature? Why are people gonna buy it? And then this one's gonna be really important, which is defendable. So for this particular product, we're getting patents. We're going the whole nine yards on this one. But ideally you have a feature that's hard to copy. So custom molds, custom engineering, custom features, things that would take six, 12, 18 months for anybody to copy if they wanted to, that's gonna give you a head start in the market. But even better is if you can allocate some budget and do even a provisional patent and then later go into an actual utility patent to actually protect that IP. So people literally can't copy those unique features that you build out. But I think product is gonna be the future. If you don't get the product right, you're basically screwed. So pre-launch, so again, this is something that's brand new to me. I don't know if it's gonna work. We're gonna share the story here so you guys can see how it plays out. I'm never launched on Kickstarter either. I just wanted to build a legit real brand and scale it to eight plus figures defensively in the right way. Amazon's gonna be a key part of that. In fact, I think we could launch this on Amazon at six figures plus a month and do really, really well. But I wanna do more than that. I wanna build an audience. I wanna have people that care about what we're creating. I wanna figure out paid media. I wanna get email addresses. I wanna get PR, I wanna get brick and mortar retail. And to do that, the playbook needs to be different. And I'm stepping into the unknown to learn this stuff. And again, we'll share it with you. So the pre-launch strategy for us is really gonna be to have number one, a lander that we're gonna drive paid media to. So this is mainly gonna be meta. So Insta and Facebook. So we're gonna drive ads into this lander. And then we've got two goals. Step number one is to capture the email. So we're launching this product April 1. We're targeting our customers again that we know about, and we're gonna give them a discount when we launch the product. The important thing though is if you get an email, those typically convert at, I don't know, three to 5% if you're doing a pretty decent job. So you're paying a lot of money for emails that may not convert into actual sales. So the other thing that we're doing is we're doing a VIP upsell. And this is a $1 reservation. So basically hit them with an ad, hopefully they like it, they care about it, go to the lander. Yeah, I'm interested when this thing launches in a couple months, give my email. Then we're gonna give them the opportunity for $1 to reserve the lowest price that we're ever gonna sell this product to. The interesting thing about these customers is they typically convert at about 30 to 40% when you launch. So even getting somebody to pay a dollar, they're more committed and they're more likely to buy when you actually launch the product. Another phase of this too is we're gonna have friendlies. So this is hustle mode, right? Anybody that you know that may be interested in your product, get their commitment to purchase, get their email, get their phone number, go into the communities where your customers hang out. Again, knowing your customers is really important. But in our case, we wanna build up a list of friendlies of two-ish hundred people that are ready to buy immediately when we launch. It's really important on Kickstarter and or Amazon because you get that initial groundswell, you hit funding goals, you start to get sales velocity, and all those things lift you in the organic algorithm of both Amazon and Kickstarter also has its own algorithm. So we've got basically this lander, which we're gonna build, hopefully three to 500 people ready to buy. And then we've got our friendlies, there'll be a couple hundred hopefully. Now the magic happens, and this is really stepping into the big unknown, right? Kickstarter, never done it before, never launched a brand from scratch off of Amazon. This is a new world. And a lot of it's very similar to Amazon. It's about how quickly you can hit your funding goals, how much traction you get. If you get that traction, Kickstarter is gonna put you on the front page. They're gonna add you to the email list. People are gonna see the social proof of the sales that you've generated and all of these things become a groundswell. PR starts to come into mix, people start hitting you up from retailers, etc. So Kickstarter is basically gonna be 30 days. Goal number one is basically to fund this thing within 15 minutes. So we're probably gonna have a funding goal 
of like 15K. Now going back to the paid media, because email addresses have been converted, you've got click events, you've got conversion events in Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, all those places where we're gonna place paid ads. We're now gonna be able to use that for paid media and really set paid media loose. Now we found a partner here because I don't necessarily want to learn paid media ads and then I want to know, if, know enough to be dangerous. But the structure that we've worked out with them is basically they're going to take 15% of any converted sales. So it's a pay to play model. I'm not paying some agency 20 grand and then we'll see how they do. It's very much performance based. But generally speaking on Kickstarter or most pre-launches that you're doing off of Amazon, roughly 30% of whatever your goal is, you're gonna to need to spend an ad. So if you wanna raise a million bucks on Kickstarter, you're probably gonna to have to spend 300 grand on ads. It's just how the math works out. Now, the other thing that we're doing here, which I'm gonna do in a major way, is influencers. I'm gonna get into the team here in a second and talk about a specific person on the team that's gonna help with this. But we really wanna hit this hard. And this is working with some small, medium, and even some heavy hitter influencers that we've built up through our network. But basically we'll have the super friendlies that launch, we'll have the people that came through the email funnel and the VIP list hit them. We're hoping that that hits the first day really, really hard and bumps up the sales. Then we bring in paid media, then we bring in influencers, and we basically hammer it as hard as we can freaking go for 30 days. Now my goal on this, is to raise 500 grand on Kickstarter top line. Again, don't know if it's gonna happen, this is new to me. Part of stepping outside your comfort zone in business is trying new things and experimenting and pushing yourself to the limit to learn new things. 500 days, the, the goal, I'd be bummed out if we didn't hit at least 100 or 200 grand. And I think that there's a stretch potential of us spilling this thing into a million bucks. So. We'll see if that's possible, I'll share it all here. And then really what's cool about this approach is you've built a brand, you've got people following you on Instagram, you've got a big email list, people know who you are, you've accumulated PR from the Kickstarter campaign, you've got active buyers ready to go, and then really the sky's the limit after this. So this is where we're gonna bring in Amazon, and again, I would expect this to do six figures plus a month if it's executed properly. But what's really cool on this is, is I'm not gonna need to rely specifically on pay-per-click. I'm not gonna have to play Amazon's game. Got my own audience, I'll have my own branded search, I'll have my own paid media externally that I can drive to Amazon. I control the destiny of this brand. It's not only Amazon and its rules and its changes that are gonna dictate things. Also see a brick and mortar retail here. Part of what's cool about building a brand on Kickstarter is, is if you do a good job and execute well, they'll likely come to you. You've got a story you can point to. Hey, I raised 200 grand on Kickstarter. This is what we're doing now. You build that social proof that makes those conversations easier. And then there's international that will spill into it both on and off of Amazon. And then finally, there's just new products. And this is why it's super important in my view to understand the niche that you're getting into, understand the customer, have a roadmap for additional products. But what's really cool, I think about uh, launching and approaching a brand in this way for new products. Again, you've got all of these assets that you built up and that you own. More importantly, you own. You know the skills on paid media, you've got PR, you've got email lists, you've got customers, you've got existing organic traffic and all of those things kind of come in here and they make these new products and these launches on other channels a heck of a lot easier. Now, a final point I'll just make in addition to the six steps is the team. You know, I've been guilty of this being the one man show. I like to build stuff solo and kind of beat to my own drummer, call my own shots, but there's value in bringing other people into a brand when you're building, if it makes sense. It helps distribute the risk financially and most importantly, it distributes the skill sets that you may not have. So there's two different people I brought into this. One is more on the ops bike industry side. It's really complex manufacturing products in this industry. So this person has 20 plus years experience, knows literally every factory in the world for every little thing. So sub components, building things right, building things quality and getting the prices right is really critical. And then he's also really tapped into the bike industry. So when you start to get into brick and mortar retail, when we're working with bike distributors, when we're going internationally, when we're going to trade shows, this person really helps fill that void and also brings a team in China that will help oversee operations. The second person is I would call creative slash influencers. 
I've actually worked with this person before. They're an amazing video person. You need to have a kick-ass video when you launch on Kickstarter. Creative assets are really critical when you're building a brand and they're expensive, but if you've got that in-house, it helps a lot. And equally important is this person scaled a business to close to eight figures already, understands the Instagram game, understands paid media. They also have a business that has a very similar customer type to this. And so they've used a hundred plus influencers. So we basically get it to go through the Rolodex, take the best of the best influencers that have worked for the other brand, integrate them in and really tie everything together. So that's it guys. I don't know what's going to happen, which is scary. It's frankly vulnerable because it's like, may work, may not, but I'm really excited to try a new playbook. I'm really excited to step out of the Amazon game and harness the skills I've built there to try some new things off of Amazon and then use those new skills and really help propel Amazon in a way that I think is gonna be way more successful in this new era where dynamics are changing, things are changing, and you've gotta really bring a different skill set to the table to be successful. I'm gonna share the journey here as always. You're gonna see it, good, bad, ugly, what happens. Hope you're along for the ride of this is your first time here and or you're interested in following the story in future videos between now and the launch in April and beyond, hit subscribe. We drop videos every single Monday. Hope to see you along for the ride. Cheers, guys.